19. After Clipping The big decision Sunday morning was not whether to go ahead with it, but which bat to use. Chris was more comfortable with the old-fashioned wood, more confident in being able to adjust his grip as necessary, especially wearing the latex gloves. But he opted for the aluminum because it seemed less likely there'd be a piece of it left behind. It wasn't the perfect time. He could have waited on Ray, made another trip down, followed the guy around for a while, double-checked everything, but screw it, you do all that and then something unexpected could pop up. His main concern as he pulled into the parking lot at 745 was the one-room taqueria three doors away, the only place in the strip mall that would likely be open today besides Chip's office. No one was around yet, and their sign said they opened at 11. It would almost be better if someone were in the place now cooking than to risk them arriving in the next 20 minutes. But what could you do? Chris pulled in at 8 o'clock on the dot and waved. He got out of the car and cracked Chip over the head with the aluminum bat just as Chip opened the office door. It was a cleaner first blow than with Donnie. Chris realized after clipping Donnie on the shoulder and neck that in that position you're better off for getting a baseball swing and coming straight down more like you're chopping wood. Still, Chip crawled into his office. He was a strong motherfucker, obviously. Not sports strong like Donnie, but street strong. He was heading for his desk, had one hand up on the side of it now, and Chris realized with alarm that there was a gun somewhere. He delivered a dozen more blows to Chip's head and torso, and Chip didn't move anymore. He waited a minute to be certain and for good measure smashed him in the head two more times, using more of a golf swing, since the head was on the floor. Just like with Donnie, he made sure he caved it in somewhat before he was through. He was tempted to say, Floyd Seeley says hello, or whatever, but realized that would be dumb, especially if the guy miraculously recovered, so he kept his mouth shut, left the office door open, went into the trunk which he had left ajar, put the bat and gloves into the bat case, and stuck it all back in the empty spare tire compartment. As he pulled out of the parking lot, two teenage kids on bicycles passed by, barefoot and wearing partial wetsuits. They had racks on the sides of their bikes that were carrying surfboards that didn't look much bigger than skateboards. They were heading towards the beach, talking to each other, and Chris didn't think they were aware of him. He took a shower in the locker room near the pool and changed his clothes. When he got back to the room, Bethany was sitting on the balcony in a terry cloth Minka hotel robe, her head back, eyes closed, taken in the morning sun. It's glorious here beyond belief, she said. Would you ever consider moving? Not right now, no. I'm sorry, that was so insensitive. I wasn't even thinking. Don't be silly. I wouldn't want to live here permanently is all. Nothing to do with my situation. I could. I could. Anyhow, give me a moment to change and we'll get some of that incredible breakfast. I didn't want to start without you this morning. No run today, I see. But how was your walk? Not as enjoyable as running. Chris said, but I got some exercise. Chris sat down, facing the ocean, but looked sideways into the room. Bethany had taken the robe off, and now there were pale green briefs and another too small white t-shirt. In the better light, the t-shirt was essentially transparent. You know what? Why bother getting dressed yet, he said. I'll go down and bring some stuff back. Too late, she said. She had pulled on a big sweatshirt and a pair of jeans. They have a quaint sitting area down there with a fountain. It feels like you're in Europe, she said. 
At breakfast, they discussed the pros and cons of living in Southern California, and Chris ran the chain of events back through his head. It felt like they should be on the road, not hanging around a couple miles from where it happened. But did it matter, really? If they were going to get him, they'd find him wherever. Might as well enjoy the Minka Hotel amenities right up until checkout time and hope to God he hadn't overlooked something basic. They took the scenic route home, up Highway 1 to Santa Barbara, and then 101 the rest of the way. Bethany fell asleep around King City and didn't wake up until they were back in her neighborhood. Chris said, you sure tossed it around whether you should go with me or not. Keep me company. Well, I made the right decisions, he said. And I was so out of it down there, I never even asked you. What business thing were you doing? Uh, I was checking out an investment. There was a window of opportunity, but I decided against it. 20. Landline. Chip said, you're back. How was it? It was uneven, Chris said. Have you ever been with a voluptuous woman who seems to like you, where you couldn't do anything about it? No. I know. She says she has a nasty ex who's gotten in her head. In that case, anything you can do, personally? I've gone through it, but if something happened, they'd be all over her, wouldn't they? Probably depends if there's been a history, a restraining order, that type of thing, Shep said. Part of my reservation is, what if I went through all that and nothing changed on her end? I see what you mean, brother. You could easily be right that the scouting trip you're referring to is what is this? Yeah, I just dropped her off 20 minutes ago. The scouting part went okay, I think. He slept late on Monday, walked over to Pete's Coffee on Chestnut, and checked his phone for the first time in three days. There were nine messages, four from Joyce, one from Meyerhofer, one from Ray, one from Bethany, one from his brother Floyd, and one from a detective cousins of Santa Rosa police. Alarmingly bad, that final one. But Chris had woken up with a serious headache and was determined not to let his mind run away from him, at least until he'd had his double latte and scone. He took his time, read the paper, and went back home to use the landline so he could be sure he understood what the police might be asking. First, he called Joyce, and she answered on the second ring. Two things, he said. Aren't you supposed to be teaching? And I'm surprised you called me on your cell. We're in lunch, she said, and I made it crystal clear to Bruce to never go in my phone again. I as much as told him if he ever did, I'd kill him. Hmm. Chris said. I called to make sure you were okay, and then you were silent all weekend, so I worried more. Chris said, I wanted to ask you, any word on anything else? No, none. Chris, I'd like to see you. I have to return a stack of messages, he said, and hung up. Detective Cousin's number went to voicemail, and Chris took a deep breath and left a message. Then he called Meyerhofer, pretty certain the guy wasn't trying to round up any more tennis games with him. Steve? Speaking. It's Chris. Seely. Meyerhofer said, What kind of cunt? And Chris hung up. He called Bethany. I'm on my walk, she said. I wanted to tell you what a wonderful time I had. I dreamt about it all night. That's good to hear. And, going forward, she said, Something may have to give, he said. That's what I was afraid you'd say. What's his first name? Jesus, Kyle. So you say, Kyle, it's been nice knowing you. He says something back, you get a restraining order. I don't know, Chris. He told her it was something to think about and got off. He started to Google Kyle Lamb in Arizona, 
but realized he was on his personal computer and just then the Santa Rosa detective called back. Chris Seeley, Ed Cousins here, SRPD. Hi. I'm sure you're familiar with a case we got working, Donald Shellhorn. Yeah, I've been following it. You got some time tomorrow? Maybe you can help with a few things. Sure, whatever you need. I'll come your way then. I'll be there at 10. You don't want me to come up there? Nah, I got other business I have to take care of in the city, so you'll be my first stop. See you then. Chris hung up, rattled, trying to think straight. This didn't sound like a routine canvassing of ex-faculty members from Pratt Valley High School. The cop wanted to get a look at him in his environment, probably check out the apartment. Realistically, though, could he actually be a suspect? He was positive Joyce hadn't said anything and couldn't imagine what else might be linking him to it now that hadn't earlier. Maybe the guy did actually have business in the city and his was just another name they'd be checking off a list. He prayed it was. Either way, the two bats currently in the trunk of his Toyota Camry, one of them containing blood and whatever else, would not help matters if the detective asked him would he mind opening it. He returned Ray's message. No answer, no voicemail, no machine, nothing. Then he called back his brother Floyd and Phoenix. It's been a while, Chris said. What's going on in the Valley of the Sun? Always refreshing to hear your voice, Chrissy, Floyd said. You'll probably be interested in this one. Somebody killed Chip Reggio. Jesus, in Las Vegas? No, in California. A friend of mine from UNLV heard about it and he called me this morning. Mob thing or what? Chris said. They think so, but he screwed so many people, who knows? Well, I'll be raising a glass to you tonight then, Chris said. Likewise. When are you coming down for a visit? I miss you. It could actually work out in the near future. You still with Suzanne? No, no. You? Nobody at the moment. Listen, is there an anthonym by you? There's an anthem. One of those awful planned communities about 45 minutes north off Interstate 17. Why? Just curious. I think there was a House Hunters episode there. You get a lot for your money. That you do, Floyd said. Hope Chipper got his money's worth, too. He didn't, Chris said, but maybe somebody else did. Chris decided he better take care of the bats on the late side, so he put on some music and stretched out on the couch for a nap. When he woke up, his headache was nearly gone, but he had had his first bad dream. He and Donnie were on stand-up surfboards that you maneuvered with a paddle, and the current pushed him into the pilings under the Manhattan Beach Pier. Every time he tried to get away from the pier, a wave would knock him back under it, and he realized he was bleeding and that, it was, that he was being cut by the waves. He liked it that people were rarely in the park off 11th Avenue after dark, but more bats in the same little lake might attract attention. Lake Merced seemed like a good alternative, more exposed to traffic, but with plenty of inconspicuous access points, especially at two in the morning. Chris backed out of the garage, and when he got to the corner, he thought, what if someone was following him? He drove around the block, double parked, shut the engine off. Then he started again in the opposite direction, saw nothing in the rearview mirror, and was pretty convinced he was being paranoid. He remembered a parking area near the Harding Park golf course and without fooling around, fired the aluminum bat into the water. He swung back through Golden Gate Park, threw the wooden one into the lake where you rented rowboats, and then found a dumpster near the Hall of Flowers and stuffed the bag into it. He checked his watch. It was 20 to 3. He had just left the park and was on Oak Street in the Panhandle, Right down the hill, actually, from Bethany's. No rush to be anywhere now, so what could it hurt to drive by? He recognized Bethany's car, a blue Mini Cooper, 
It was parked on the right side of the driveway that she shared with her upstairs neighbor who parked on the left. Directly behind the Mini Cooper was another car. There were lights on in Bethany's flat. Hmm. Chris rang the bell. He waited a minute, rang it again, waited a bit longer, and got back in the car and went home. He slept for a few hours and took his run, trying to rehearse how it might go with Detective Cousins. There was clearly a tricky balance between volunteering too much information and coming across like you're holding on to something. Cousins arrived at 10.15 and Chris came down to let him in. Ed, a pleasure, the detective said. He was wearing a suit. He sat at the kitchen table and thanked Chris for the cup of coffee. Traffic into the city, Chris said. Not that bad. Nice apartment. I lived in the marina once upon a time. A different animal now. You said it, Chris said. The families are pretty much all gone. Now on the homicide. Did you know this fellow? Cousins opened a notebook. I saw him around school, but I never taught him, so I didn't really know him. I did watch him pitch several times. What about Megan Britta? You knew her? Yep, I had her in a class, both Megan and Lindy, who ended up together at that party. What was your reaction after the accident? You mean Donnie or Megan? Megan, Cousin said. Chris said, my view of it was the guy shouldn't be walking around enjoying himself like nothing happened. So you think he didn't pay a price? Not at all. I mean, he obviously did in the end. Cousin said, so it's your opinion he was killed because of what happened to Megan. I'm not sure, but it would be hard to 100% rule out. How well do you know Joyce McCann? Whoa. Chris said, pretty well. We dated for a year and a half when I was teaching up there. We're still close. Did she take Megan hard? She did. She had a real tough time. Megan reached out to her not too long before it happened. She's had a tough time since Donnie, too, because it rekindled it. How do you know? I can tell. How about Megan's family? You know anything about them, the detective said? I really don't, other than there apparently wasn't much of one. Where'd you get the shiner? Cousin said. Ah, it's embarrassing, but Joyce's boyfriend hit me. Guy named Bruce, apparently. Oh, yeah? She's been coming down sometimes. Last Thursday, I guess he followed her. When she left, I got what I deserved. Bruce who? I don't know. She just said he was in the wine business. Big, sturdy guy like a bodybuilder. Well-dressed. Bruce Gilbright, cousin said. I don't know. Black hair, slick back? Yeah. Could be a match. We know that guy well, if it is. Used to own a strip club at the end of Santa Rosa Avenue. Difficult gentleman to deal with. I actually remember that place, Chris said. You surprised Ms. McCann would get mixed up with a guy like that? Well, my guess is she doesn't know that much about him. She says it's only been a couple months. Now I'm going to ask you a hard question, Cousin said, and I expect a stand-up answer. You got that? Chris said yes. Could Joyce have gotten Bruce to kill Shellhorn? On a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is that? That's a zero, Chris said, not even a possibility. Cousins gave him a long look. Well, I thank you very much for your time. I hope I can help, Chris said. What else do you have in the city today? Ah, my old man is out in the sunset. Not doing that well. 87 years old, the bastard refuses to allow any help. Probably what keeps him going, though, the feistiness, Chris said. Maybe. Makes it harder to give a homicide the attention it deserves. We'll figure it out, though, sooner or later. Chris walked Detective Cousins down and saw him off and continued right to the nearest bar, which wasn't Weatherby's or the Booker Lounge, but Joe's Place. He ordered a straight double scotch 
and tried to piece together what exactly had just happened. He put in a couple hours that afternoon on the computer at the Funston Library. One reason he was pretty sure the Pocatello Thad Simmons was the same one who raped Bonnie was that according to Google, he was running a gym out there in Idaho now. In 1992, when it happened, Simmons and Bonnie had desk jobs at Eastern Sports Clubs, one of those success stories with gyms sprouting up all over. The company had moved into a new headquarters in northern Westchester County, which was where the piece of scum assaulted her. Chris found a little bit on Bethany. Her maiden name seemed to be Hoig, so the name she went by now, Lamb, was most likely her husband's. There was a Kyle Lamb listed in Anthem, Arizona. Address, phone number, the whole works. On Street View, you could see the actual house with a pickup truck parked in the driveway. Before he left the library, he checked the LA Times online and found two articles. The first was from yesterday with no writer's byline. Financial advisor found slain in Hermosa Beach office. March 12, 2017. Anthony Reggio, 46, of Manhattan Beach, was found dead yesterday afternoon in his South Bay office, the victim of an apparent attack. Reggio was found in the ground floor office of Good Fund Financials, LLC, at 213 Norton Lane in Hermosa. Police said there was no sign of forced entry. The body was discovered at approximately 12.30 p.m., by a patron of the nearby Taqueria San Jose. And then one from today. Slain Hermosa financial planner had reputed organized crime ties by Arlene Gonzalez. March 13, 2017, a financial advisor found dead Sunday in his Hermosa Beach office had ties to organized crime, according to a source close to the investigation. Anthony Chip Reggio, who lived at 1178 Primrose Street in Manhattan Beach, was known to both Las Vegas police and LAPD as a suspected member of the Romano crime family, the source said. Reggio, 46, was originally from Hoboken, New Jersey, and had been a Las Vegas resident for 16 years before moving to the South Bay in 2008, records show. He operated Good Fund Financials, LLC, and was on the board of Citizens for Manhattan Beach Preservation. A Primrose Street neighbor, Jonathan Sweet, said, Chip was the nicest guy you could ever meet. He played ball with the kids. He was Santa Claus at our Christmas block party. We're all in shock. Police said Reggio was beaten to death Sunday morning in his Norton Lane office and that robbery has been ruled out as a motive. Police are asking anyone with information to call their hotline at 888-826-4800. Worth keeping an eye on, Chris thought, but definitely good about the mob angle. There was an afternoon run that he did sometimes when he wanted an extra workout across Lombard and up the Divisadero Hills to Broadway and back down, He'd repeat it a few times. Today the energy wasn't there, but he forced his way through it. Hopefully it was the double scotch and the stress of talking to cousins and nothing physical screwing him up yet. The shocker was that cousins might be suspecting Joyce. Of course, one positive was the police up there apparently didn't like Bruce if it was the same guy, and that could keep them busy for a while. It was impossible to tell if Cousins was slick and knew what he was doing or was just an ordinary cop fishing around without a plan. Either way, it seemed wise not to procrastinate too long on the rest of his own business in case things suddenly caved in on him. By the time he showered and ate something and paid a few bills, it was after seven. And Chris figured, why not go see what was up at Meyerhofer's? The guy had a small mansion on Washington Street in Presidio Heights, not far from where they played tennis at Julius Kahn. 
Chris pulled up and parked across the street. If Meyerhofer was home, there might be some fireworks. And if not, he could say hello to Brigida. What was the harm? Brigida answered the door. She was dressed modestly with little or no makeup, a gorgeous woman in her day, it was clear now, looking entirely appropriate in her 50s. Chris Seeley, he said, Steve's tennis partner. Remember, at Califoods? Oh, yes, absolutely, Chris, she said. Won't you come in? Thank you, but actually, is Steve around by chance? No, I'm sorry you've missed him. He has a business meeting tonight. Really, Chris said. Okay, then, I'll come in for a moment if it's no trouble. Please, by all means, she said. Can I get you something? They were in the formal living room. A club soda type thing would hit the spot, he said. Brigida came back with drinks on a tray and a bowl of nuts, everything tasteful. It's none of my business, Chris said. But does Steve frequently have business meetings at night? He can, yes, Brigida said. There's no rhyme or reason to Steve's schedule. That's the way it's always been. He's an interesting man, Chris said. Do you ever think he might be cheating on you? Brigida sat up straight, her face contorted. I'm sorry? Chris nodded. He is. At least he says he is. The words took time to register. You've caught me totally. I don't know what to say. I'm stunned, Brigida said. I'm glad I said something then. It got to the point where I couldn't hear about it anymore. Yes, then, I'm glad you did too, she said. Thank you. I needed to know, obviously. Here's my number. If I can do anything for you, anytime, please call me, okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. He left her seated on the couch in a daze and headed to Weatherby's to take the edge off the day for the second time. 21. Driveway. Hey, what's shaking, my brother? Chep said. One thing I'm learning, Chris said. Don't get a terminal disease. You act different. I'll try to remember that. Any updates on a topic I might be interested in? Well, the cops talked to me today. Are you shitting me? I don't think I'm their man. At the moment, anyway. And they have that part right? Shep said. I feel they have it right. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going there, Shep said. That other situation, though, Chris said, with the intimidating ex-husband? I was in her neighborhood at three in the morning, so I swung by. Any particular reason you were out at three in the morning? I had to put something in Lake Merced. Oh. Anyway, there was an extra car in the driveway. See, this type of thing, Shep said. Too much nonsense. It's generally not worth it. We'll see. Maybe you're right, Chris said. His phone rang and he answered it. You're an ass. You know that? A female voice said. Just a moment, please, he said. I can barely hear you. He went outside. I said you're an ass. Shame on you. It took a moment and he realized it was Monica. Um, hi, Monica. What do you mean? You don't even know? You're more pathetic than we thought. I'm real sorry, Chris said. I'm at a loss here. What are you talking about? Allison's open mic? Tonight? In San Rafael? Ring a bell? You told her you'd be there. Shit. I can't believe I forgot all about it. Where is she? Let me speak to her. She's right here, driving back to Berkeley. But she doesn't want to talk to you. You obviously could care less but it meant a lot to her to have you at a performance, which, of course, you had better things to do than show up at. How did she do? Chris, just don't pretend you're interested, all right? Just go back to your party. She hung up. That wasn't like the authorities or anything, was it? Shep said quietly. You look a little shook up. Nah, I left someone hanging. My brain is screwy. This is what I'm talking about, how you're not the same. Let's face it, though, partner, you've got a lot on your plate. You get a pass. I hate standing people up, though, Chris said. I don't sleep well afterwards. 
On Wednesday afternoon, he dropped in on Ray in the dialysis department at SF General. Well, now looky here what the cat brung in, Ray said. He had two strands of red rubber tubing taped to his forearm that Chris assumed entered his arm someplace and then continued into a couple of canisters attached to a standing computerized machine. Ray was wearing a sweater and Oakland A's cap and sitting on a hospital type recliner partially covered by a blanket. There were nine or ten identical patient setups and several TVs were blaring. I called you back, Chris said, but there was no option to leave a message. And there never will be, Ray said. I hate the telephone. I'm a fan of direct contact. Good thing I remembered your schedule then, Chris said. What'd you want when you called me? I got your thing is all. You did? Told you I'd look into handling your business, didn't I? So why are you surprised? No, it's just I thought you might put me in touch with someone or whatever, not finish it off. You want it or not? Oh yeah, listen, I appreciate it. Don't be jumping for joy like it's Christmas morning, Ray said. You setting up for some serious shit now. How much do I owe you? You owe me nothing. If you want, you can buy me another drink. Ray, you're a good man, you know that? So after all these years later, that'd be your conclusion then? Yeah. You're still a little white boy piece of crap, Ray said. But looking at the whole picture, I guess I'll take it. I'll pick you up tomorrow night, Chris said. I got a place we can unwind. Here's some music. Fine with me, long as it ain't the joint on Chestnut Street again. It's near there, but a brother's in charge of this one. That don't mean nothing, Ray said. I'll see you at eight, Chris said. When he left Ray, he called Allison. Hey, he said. Hey, back, I guess. About last night, your performance. It's okay. Nope, it's not okay. But getting beyond that for a second, I'm taking a drive out to Idaho. Be gone probably a week. Have a nice trip then. Would you want to come? I mean, I know that's a ridiculous question, completely out of left field. Sure. Hold on, just like that? Sure? Yes, it sounds like fun. Fun in what way? What are you going to do? I don't know. Have an adventure. Oh, well, I checked the weather and it's snowing in the Sierras. I hate dealing with chains, but it's supposed to be clear Saturday. That work? Yes, it does, she said. I have to run, uh, but thanks. Any time, he said, pretty sure he just piled on something he shouldn't have. After dinner, he drove over to Bethany's. I was in the neighborhood, he said. I'm glad you were, she said. Are you hungry? They went in the kitchen. No, but I'll watch you eat, if I'm not disturbing anything. You're not right now, but Monday, why did you ring the bell in the middle of the night? A pause. The lights were on, Chris said, and there was another car. I was curious. My girlfriend is having a relationship problem. She stayed over, but truth be told, it's none of your business. I can't disagree with you there. I thought maybe it was Kyle, though. That would be stretching it a bit, don't you think? Yes and no, Chris said. He he couldn't reach you all weekend. He grew concerned and decided he better find out what's up. Bethany said, I'll admit when you frame it like that, that's the kind of behavior I do worry about. Or is it my condition, Chris said. What? You're turned off by my situation. No, Chris, please, you couldn't be more off base. Which would be understandable, he said. Believe me. She stood up and came around behind him and started rubbing his shoulders. It's me, it's not you. But if Kyle died in an accident or someone killed him or something, would you feel better? She stopped with his shoulders. Excuse me? Just your first impulse before you analyze it. We used to have to take these star tests at school, and they tell you the best answer was usually the first one that came into your head. After that, you overcomplicate it. Okay, hypothetically, she said, 
my first reaction is I'd be relieved. You would. But I'd also be sad. Forget the sad part, Chris said. You'd get over that. But would you be scared of the police? Why would I be? Well, I mean, let's say, for example, I killed them. They could suspect you talked me into it. Okay, Chris, this is going off the deep end now. Let's stick with reality. Fine. Would you want to take a shower? Bethany gave him the half smile and the you're not going to let up, are you, look that he'd seen a few times at Manhattan Beach. Okay, she said. Okay? She didn't answer, but she headed back there, so he followed. She did him the favor of leaving on a few items of clothing that he could take off, and soon the hot water and soap and tight quarters were a comfortable mix. One thing is clear, Chris said, if those were any further developed, there wouldn't be room for both of us in here. You are a piece of work, you know that, she said. The main event followed in the bedroom, and Bethany had been right. It was disappointing. Does that mean you don't want to stay the night? She said, I'd like to, unless you have something else planned that's none of my business. I'm going out to Idaho, so I might not see you for a little while. Gee, you're certainly doing your share of traveling. She was curled up against him. You mean for a guy on the way out, Chris said? Okay, yes, for someone on the way out. You're right. You discover an impulsiveness you didn't know you had. It's not entirely the worst thing. I actually envy you in a way, she said. You're full of shit. I know. Will you be traveling alone this time? Doesn't look like it, he said. In that case, I won't call you when you're gone. I'll wait until you're back safe and sound. Just to get it straight, though, he said. That wasn't Kyle the other night, but it wasn't a girlfriend in need either, was it? No, she said. It wasn't. 22. Wiped away. When he got home Thursday morning, he checked his messages, and there were two from Joyce, which he deleted without listening to them, and one missed call from a number he didn't recognize. He called back, and it was Brigitte Meyerhofer. I wanted to apologize for my behavior the other night, she said. I have truly been such a fool. What behavior? I couldn't have been more rude and self-absorbed. You were a real gentleman to take the very difficult step and inform me, especially since Steve is your friend. Does Steve know that you know? Oh, yes. He denied everything and was quite furious at me, and he immediately booked a business trip to San Diego. That where he is now? Yes, it's all so incredibly transparent. What a moron I have been. Well, maybe you'd like to have a drink tonight and listen to a little music. Oh, I see. With you? I have a friend. We're going to hang out. Nothing serious. I can pick you up. Well, it certainly does sound appealing, she said. Changing up the routine, Chris said. It never hurts. I'll see you a little past eight. Joyce called again around noon, and this time he answered. She said she absolutely had to speak to him in person, so he said, fine, whatever. He'd see her after school. Then he went to the library and started doing some more digging on the drunk driver who hit his childhood friend Eric. Chris and Eric played catch together in Eric's oversized backyard, and sometimes Chris would stay for dinner. The Mossmans had a ski cabin near Sugar Bowl, and a few times he would be invited along. Eric went to a private school, and Chris had closer friends, but the kid was nice enough, and he certainly didn't deserve to get wiped away by this guy. When he and Eric were 14, the Mossmans moved to Tiburon, and they didn't cross paths much after that. Chris did see Eric's older sister, Lorraine, in the neighborhood, visiting her friend Amanda. Lorraine eventually went to Humboldt State near Eureka, and Eric was a new 16-year-old driver on the way up there to visit her for a weekend when the asshole crossed over the line on Highway 20 north of Ukiah. Lorraine dropped out of school and got into the drug and pornography scene 
in the San Fernando Valley. Mr. Mossman died a year and a half after the accident, and Mrs. Mossman moved back into the city. Chris would now and then see her walking her dog on Fillmore Street, but he tried to avoid her because when he said hello, it was too hard on her. Chris had heard the guy got a year in prison and was out after eight months. He couldn't come up with a name. The search archives for the Marin IJ and Chronicle didn't go back far enough since the accident took place in 1986. So he asked the librarian what to do. She told him his best bet was the main library on Larkin Street, where they had microfiche copies of old newspapers. He drove down there, got set up in a machine, and found the guy's name was Jerry Smith. The article said he was 24 years old and from Santa Rosa. Chris Googled him in Sonoma County, and there were a few results, but none of them any good because the ages were wrong. If he was 24 in April of 86, this guy would be 54 or 5 now. That also meant he should have graduated from high school in 1979. Chris set up an anonymous Gmail account on the library computer and emailed all five Santa Rosa high schools, telling them he was a long-lost alumnus and was there any source of updates they could provide on fellow classmates. That was about as far as he could go, especially since it was after three and he unfortunately had to meet Joyce. She was parked waiting for him when he got home. The goon follow along this time, he said. He's in Lodi this week. That makes sense, Chris said. I read that, believe it or not, they grow more grapes in San Joaquin County than in Napa and Sonoma combined. I wouldn't mind something to drink, she said. Upstairs or on Chestnut Street? Your place. Don't worry, I'll behave myself. Chris made margaritas in the blender and brought out some chips and salsa. I spoke to my brother Floyd the other day, he said. Did you ever meet him? Yes. You don't remember that, Joyce said? We had dinner with him at the airport that time when he was on his way to Hawaii. He had a really pretty girlfriend. Chris said, it sounds like they broke up. But what's going on with you? Lindy Marita came to see me, she said. Oh, yeah? She said the police talked to her about Donnie, and they asked if she thought I might have wanted Donnie dead. Is that right? What? Doesn't that shake you up? They think I might have killed Donnie. Listen to me now. They don't think anything. I had a cop talk to me, too. This is what they do when they don't have shit. They throw stuff against the wall and hope something miraculously sticks. So why didn't they ask me directly then? I'm telling you, it doesn't mean anything. But let me ask you this. Could Bruce have done it? What? What's his last name, Chris said. Gilbright. Okay, so what they're reaching for is Bruce might have killed Donnie because he saw that you hadn't gotten over Megan and he thought it would make you happy. I'm sorry, Chris, but that is fucking crazy. They've had trouble with Bruce in the past. Various things. Obviously, he has violent tendencies. It kind of makes sense. I know he socked you in the eye, which was wrong, way wrong. But he's not a killer, Joyce said. For all I know, you're right. I'm just telling you straight what the police at this point are looking at. Bruce. They have nothing else. Chris poured them seconds on the margaritas and no one spoke for a few minutes. So, Lindy coming over and all, you're saying I can relax, she said. Absolutely, unless you had a hand in it that you're not telling me about. Very funny. And you know how it goes. Their Bruce theory may or may not pan out and they could be back to square one. I see, Professor, she said. Meanwhile... Have you interacted with your doctor's secretary recently? I have. That's interesting. Could you please tell me about it as you make love to me? 
Oh, no, Jesus, he said, but he found himself cooperating, and they didn't make it to the bedroom. Ray was dressed the best Chris had seen him. It's how you do it, Ray said. You go out at night, show some respect. You still wearing duds. Ray handed him a shoebox tied up with the twine. Chris opened the trunk of the car and put the box in the familiar empty spare tire compartment. Okay, now I'm throwing in a curveball, Chris said. We're picking someone up. Good by me. A lady in her 50s. She found out her husband is unfaithful and she's having a hard time dealing with it. Loosen herself up could help. And she found this out how, Ray said. I told her. Man, you a mischievous motherfucker. You more complex every day. Brigitte was wearing a modest dress with a shawl. Her hair was up and she looked elegant. A pleasure to meet you, Ray said. For me as well, Brigitte said. I'm honored to be invited. Don't be getting ahead of yourself, Ray said. The last place Seeley took me was full of 20-year-old kids. Let's see what he come up with this time. Parking was impossible, so Chris let Ray and Brigida off in front of the Booker Lounge and drove across Lombard to find a spot. When he got back, he could see them through the window, set up with drinks and talking steady and bobbing their heads. I was asking Brigida how she got hooked up with the likes of you, Ray said. Didn't know you was a tennis player. I'm no good, Chris said. Brigida's husband Steve owns me. The way I hear it is you are quite well matched, Brigida said. Do you do any sports, Ray? Those days is long past, Ray said. All except for dancing. I'll show you some moves when the music gets started. A band was setting up four black guys and a frizzy blonde woman who Chris guessed would be doing the singing. Well, this is just splendid, Brigida said. Ray, I'm not sure if Chris told you I'm in a transition. How's that? My marriage after 23 years is not where I had assumed it was. It certainly creates occasion for pause, especially at my age. Well, one important thing you got going, Ray said, is you a beautiful woman. You are, Chris said. My gosh, thank you so much, Brigida said. Okay, here now, Ray said. Come on. The, bank had, the band had started up and the frizzy blonde woman was singing Fly Me to the Moon. Two horns, a keyboard, and drums behind her. I, I couldn't, said Brigida, smiling. Ray took her hand and next thing they were dancing together like they'd been doing it a long time. More couples crowded the little dance floor and Booker came over to Chris's table. That's a fine woman, Chrissy, he said. How'd y'all manage that? Not sure, but she likes it here is the main thing. The band is good, too. That Ray Holmes with her? Yeah. You know him, then? Little bit of dealings at one time. Looked like he got it cleaned up pretty good now. That other question you had, when you was given your hypotheticals about weapons and so forth? Yeah, Chris said. Couldn't get a straight answer on that. Meaning they might be able to trace where bullets come from, Chris said. Might or might not, Booker said, but that'd be telling me be smart about it. I appreciate it. Not that I'm expecting to need that advice. Good then, Booker said, and he moved on to say hello to another table. Ray and Brigida kept it up for the first set. This one... She downplay it, Ray said when they were back, sweat dripping off both of them, but she's a live wire. I was just following you, Brigida said. You're a magnificent dancer. And the thing of it is, Chris said, walking around, you move like an old man. Then you get out there and you're flying. Except now it feels mighty nice to be stretching out, Ray said. I got nothing left. Chris said, anyone hungry? The food's good here. They ate and drank, and after a while, Brigida pulled Chris onto the dance floor. Kind of embarrassing being out here after Ray, he said. Brigida said, I haven't felt this exhilarated in quite some time. I can only imagine what Steve would think. You know what, Chris said, he's a good man. When you strip it all away, he wants you happy. Do you think so?
Of course, Chris said. He loves you. I meant, do you think he's a good man? Oh, Chris said. Maybe not. 23. Seafood Ray had included some bullets, so Chris thought he'd better practice. He was tired from the late night at Booker's, but he set his alarm for 5.30 and forced himself out of bed and onto the road. By 6.15, he was parked at one of the trailheads near the top of Mount Tam, figuring there shouldn't be too much action in the area on a Friday morning at daybreak. He walked uphill a half mile until he came to a clearing with a stand of Monterey Pines on the far side. He took the gun out of his backpack. Ray told him it was a 38. It was black steel and the finish seemed crude and near the handle it said checkpoint. C-Z-E-C-H-P-O-I-N-T He pushed the cylinder to the side, loaded it carefully, picked out a tree, and fired off six shots, emptying the gun. He missed everything on the first two, but at least hit various parts of the tree with the last four. The thing definitely kicked back, but it wasn't as intense as you heard about. He decided since he was there anyway, he might as well do a hike so he followed the loop toward the summit and back down. There were spectacular views of Stinson Beach from the west side of the trail, the thin white strand curving toward the Bolinas Lagoon. He thought of his ex-wife, Connie. The two of them had rented a beach cottage at Stinson one summer, and way too many of their friends came to visit, and the partying got out of hand. He and Connie had gotten married too young, and they flew to Mexico for a divorce after 17 months. The last he'd heard, she had four kids and was living in Gainesville, Florida, with her second husband, a NASCAR mechanic. It was a little after eight when he got back to the trailhead, so he drove down to Starbucks in Mill Valley and killed time waiting for the Salvation Army in San Rafael to open. And then he bought another metal bat. You never knew, and the truth was he wasn't all that comfortable with the damn gun. Driving back across the bridge, there was a call from Meyerhofer. When he got to the city, Chris parked along the bay and called him back. Meyerhofer said, Just answer me one thing, cunt lips. Was it you said something to my wife? I told her you loved her, but that you didn't have the greatest character, Chris said. You fuck, where are you right now? On the Marina Green. Clear as a day. You can see for miles, Chris said. You wait right there, you dick. I'll kick your fucking ass halfway to Richmond, you prick face. What time, Chris said. Fuck you. I'll wait for you if you give me a time, but I thought Brigida said you were down in San Diego on business. Know what, pal? First, I'm going to rip your eyeballs out, and then I'll urinate into the sockets. That mean then, Steve, you don't want to hit some tennis balls at Julius Kahn? My game's getting rusty. You're dead, Meyer offer said, and hung up. Chris sat in the car and watched a huge container ship sail into the bay, two tugboats escorting it. The ship had a foreign-looking green and red emblem on the bridge, and he could only imagine how ready the crew was to get off the thing. He called Brigida. Hope I didn't wake you up, he said. You did not, she said. I slept like a baby, though. The evening was so enjoyable. I honestly don't know where the time went. Well, at the risk of being forward, would you want to follow it up with a bite of dinner tonight? Do you mean with you and Ray again? No. No just with me. I see. Chris, would you mind if I called you this afternoon? I'm going to need to do a bit of soul searching. Absolutely, please do, he said. It was close enough to lunchtime that it made sense to pop in at Weatherby's. On the way there, Bethany called. This is business, not personal, she said. Dr. Steiner asked me to get you on the line. 
Tell him my schedule won't permit it, Chris said. Chris, it was Steiner. Listen, it's been four weeks since your diagnosis. We need to follow up. Billy, it's simple, Chris said. When I collapse, I'll let you know, okay? Are you noticing any changes at all? I feel pretty good. Other than the energy's not 100% there sometimes. Not sure if I'm screwed that way or if I'm running around trying to do too much. Why are you running around trying to do too much? What's the need? Well, you don't want to waste time, obviously. And be good to leave the world just a tad better off than I found it. Okay, fine, Steiner said, whatever. When can you come in? You're not fooling around with Bethany, are you? I mean, I wouldn't blame you. A pause. God damn it, Chris, I'm here for you on this. I know you are, Chris said. It was a lively midday crowd, and it took a Shep a few minutes to get to him. Hey, my friend, always nice. Breaks up my day around here. My doctor wants to see me. It's been a month. You don't look that bad, Shep said. Your color's fine. You seem to have sufficient energy for womanizing, too, is my impression. Some of that, yeah, but nothing's clicked. I'm thinking at the end, I'm just going to have a bunch of people mad at me. And what about the other proceedings? I'm going out of state tomorrow, see what happens. I'm not even positive I have the correct match. So how do you make sure? I guess I have to ask him. And if you get a satisfactory answer, take care of it right then. Then or later, it depends. Or if he comports himself really well, maybe not at all. The whole deal is more work than most people realize. You riding solo, Shep said? Now nah, I got someone coming along, I think. Well, I gotta go. It's been nuts in here. Send me a postcard. Chris was dozing off in his recliner with house hunters on when Brigitte called. She said, Needless to say, I've been introspective these past few days. Uh-huh, Chris said. My short-term conclusion is yes. Dinner tonight sounds perfect. Wow. Did I startle you, Brigitte said? Actually, you did. But you're making the right decision. When you have to go through something like this, the worst thing is sit around. He told her he'd pick her up at 7 and realized he better get the heck organized if he expected to drive to Idaho tomorrow. When he finished packing the car, he called Allison. No, I didn't forget, she said. And can you bring your guitar? Just bring yours, he said. I am, but then we can jam and stuff. Ah, geez. Jamming's not at the top of my list, to be honest. So what is? All right, I'll try. Be watching for me at five, sharp. I don't want to have to turn off the engine. That early? Do we have to make it there in one day? Definitely. Chris, you're no fun. Get a good night's rest, he said. Brigida said she wouldn't mind seafood, so they went to the Spinnaker in Sausalito. The restaurant was built on posts sticking up out of the water, and you had all glass walls with views in every direction. My, the city is breathtaking tonight, Brigida said. I've never been here. I had always assumed they catered to tourists. Took me a long time to try it myself, Chris said. Funny thing is, you hear the original old-time San Francisco accent in here. Apparently, it's popular with the North Beach families that moved to Marin. Well, she said, the Petrali Soul is my favorite, and this is as delicious as I've ever had. It's very nice of you to bring me here, Chris. Steve called me this morning, he said. He did? Oh. You don't think Steve could ever hurt you or anything, do you? Gosh, why would you ask that? He was in a threatening mood. Toward me, not toward you. Pretty sure it was an act. But he's never put his hands on you, has he? No, never. Okay, I'm glad to hear it. Are you looking to the future at all? 
Yes, of course I know I have to make a change. It's so hard to conceptualize turning my world upside down, though. So why do anything for a while? Let it settle. Who knows? You might work it out. I fear that is impossible, she said. Whenever I read about any sort of addiction, it seems the person never ultimately overcomes it. You think Steve has an addiction? Maybe not a clinical addiction, but yes. He's not just a guy with a need to prove himself, the way we all are to an extent. That's entirely plausible, but I went through his desk drawers from top to bottom, notebooks, scraps of paper, it goes on and on, and has apparently for quite some time. Chris waited a minute. Getting back to that one thing, though, if Steve ever did put his hands on you, you'd call me right away? It's certainly not something I'm anticipating, but fine. Middle of the night, whenever. If it makes you feel better, please know that I would. On a lighter note, the bread pudding may not sound like much as desserts go, Chris said, but it's pretty darn good. Heading home, he asked if she wanted to get an after-dinner drink somewhere. I was contemplating that as well, she said. Where do you normally go? I'm fairly limited. I mostly stay in my neighborhood. You have Booker's, where we went, and then Weatherby's, which tends to be my establishment of choice, even though I don't really fit in there. Any place is fine, actually, she said. Or maybe you'd like to come to my house. It would be my pleasure. Ooh, When is Steve due to return from San Diego? On Sunday. And you don't think he he could be stepping up his business schedule now that the proverbial shit has hit the fan? No, but if that were the case, too bad. You and I are having a drink together. I'd call that pretty mild compared to his goings-on, wouldn't you? I have to say I'm admiring your spark, he said. Chris didn't want to get too sidetracked with Idaho looming, but Steve's well-stocked liquor cabinet was appealing. Brigida sat him down on the couch and, sure enough, brought out the cognac. I don't know much, he said, but something tells me old France. You're not far off, she said. This is about 50 years old. Chateau de Montefaux. Steve has a connection. An hour went by and Chris said he better get going. Is that non-negotiable, Brigitte said, because you're splendid company at the moment. I have an early day tomorrow, but sure, I don't mind sticking around a little longer, he said. Do you work on Saturday, she said? Sometimes, yeah. So, I'm not trying to back you in a corner or anything, but as a general question... If you slept with someone, would you tell Steve? She kept her eyes on him, steady, serious. Absolutely. I might not volunteer the information, but when asked, I would be completely truthful. And he wouldn't get violent or anything? Chris, you keep addressing that. After 23 years of marriage, you know someone. You'd think, but look what happened. I'm talking about someone's inner nature, she said. Granted, Steve gets upset on occasion, but I can tell you he's not a violent person. Chris moved over, touched her cheek, and gave her a little peck on the lips. A test kiss. Brigida responded in full, and soon the trip to Idaho didn't seem all that urgent. The sunlight woke him up. What time do you have, he said. It's 9.20, she said. I've been watching you sleep for quite a while. He bolted up. Wait a second. Oh, my God. Chris, is everything all right? I just really blew it with the time. I can't believe this. I feel I'm partly to blame then. No, no, not in a million years, he said. Everything will be fine. It's not like someone's going to die. Come here. Brigida nestled in against him. You treated me so wonderfully last night, she said. What can I do for you? Just stay here for a minute would be good. Then I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee to go. Oh, that's perfect. I'll brew you a Scandinavian blend. 
I'll think you'll love it. When she went downstairs, Chris took a shower and got dressed. There was a bureau on Steve's side of the bed with several framed photos of Brigida on top. Next to the pictures was a wooden box. Chris looked inside and it was full of loose change. Hmm. He dug around in his wallet and pulled out a business card from his short-lived post-chronicle writing career. It said, Chris Seeley, Freelancer. He stuck the card on top of the change and closed the box. Brigitte was right. The coffee was special. In Denmark, we do a lighter roast, she said, which highlights the flavors intrinsic in the beans. Now you're going a little too far, he said, but you know what? You're a special woman. I'm predicting a solid future. She gave him a kiss. I'll see you again? Not right away, but promise me you'll call me anytime. And you please be safe as well, she said.